I, I believe everyone is an artist. Arts is a human rights and that, you know, um, we should all have that, you know, that basic kind of access to it. My name is Ngoc Jan Vu or Ngoc Tran Vu. And I'm a Vietnamese American artist and organizer based in Boston. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Especially in this time and age, I think being Vietnamese um, is about remembrance. It's about honoring um you know, my responsibility as a Vietnamese person to my community, to my culture, to my um, heritage. And the Vietnamese, you know, diaspora is, is complex as any other diaspora. It's about resiliency, it's about survival, it's about, you know, hustle, you know, it's about, there's, there's a lot. And I think um, to be Vietnamese American is to hold all of these um, with me. My family and I came to the U.S. as um, refugees in the early 90s. Um, my dad was part of, um, you know, the, the South Vietnamese Army, and we came over in the third wave. Um, so kind of in the early 90s, where um, under kind of because he was a part of the military, um, we came over with, you know, had all the humanitarian operation program um, because he was in, you know, internment camps, re-educational camps. So that was how we were able to, to come to the U.S. And I came over when I was four and um, we were actually supposed to go to California, but then there was some stuff with our um, sponsor kind of families and everything. So we, um, um, at the last minute, I, I was told that they kind of pulled out, decided not to kind of go through with it. And so um, the people basically asked my dad, like, where would you want to go? And he was like, um, he's like, I think Boston. Um, I heard there's good schoolings there. And, um, and that's that's the version he told me. So he's like, that's how we ended up in, in the Boston in the cold area. And he was like, yeah, I heard there's good school there. I want, you know, I'm the fourth of five kids. He's like, I want my kids to, you know, um, to have, you know, good education, you know, you know, I left my country for, you know, to make sure that they're, they have a better future. Um, and so that was how we ended up in, in the Boston area. And I grew up um, working class, um, you know, as most kind of refugee families um, coming over here with very little. And um, I even found out, this is really interesting, that maybe not so much so, you know, new these days, but, you know, refugee families, um, we have to, like, pay back our airfares. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that is, is not even like, oh, like the government gives it for free. It's like we come up and we go in like debt. It's not even like we come with like zero or little amount. It's like we're, we're actually in debt. Mm -hmm. So I remember, you know, with a family of seven, my dad's like, yeah, we owed like thousands of dollars. And he was like, I had to figure out how to, you know, pay that back. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, you know, we grew up that there were, you know, I also grew up kind of, we grew up in the projects too. And so um, kind of through this lens, I really thought about um I was exposed to really like you know thinking about class you know like firsthand thinking about you know language barrier culture barriers being you know um supporting my my family my you know our, my siblings and I um support them with you know interpretations with making sure the paperwork making sure we were able to apply for medicare or food stamp all that and like you know um so I would say that's you know part of my childhood making sure that you know um you know kind of where, yeah, our parents, you know, were there, you know, supporting us, but then it's like also um, my siblings and I making sure that, um, you know, we were okay, we couldn't, you know, navigate the schools by ourselves kind of thing. And so I would say that's, you know, very much part of my childhood, um, navigating that and also growing up in the neighborhoods that I did. Um, and then, you know, going through public schools and then also going to private schools too. Um, but yeah, navigating all that at a, you know, at a young age. Yeah, we, we don't talk about that sort of um, the difference in what most of our fathers who sort of um, went through a different it's a different class of, of society in Vietnam. And then when they get to the U.S., it becomes a totally different thing. They end up in the inner cities or they end up in places where it's a stark difference from where they kind of um, lived in Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, it's also very intentional too. Um, one thing I would say is that like, 
depending on, you know, what year you, you came in, you know, from like, you know, post kind of um, war era, it's like a lot of Vietnamese people, they can tell kind of what class, like if you came in like, you know, 75, you came in the 80s, the 90s, it's almost like, of course, there's, you know, always exception, but for the most part, you can kind of get a sense of like, the access that people have and the privilege or that, you know, or they were sponsored, you know, that, that gives you a strong sense. That's why they always, people always ask, like, you know, Vietnamese community, what year? what year did you come over? Cause mm-hmm. they can really place you. And then um, to your point about, um, yeah, coming over and like, you know, even, you know, people who may be, you know, wealthy, educated, you know, in Vietnam coming over that, you know, transition is like, you're kind of for the most part starting from scratch. People may have access, other families here, but it's like, you're kind of starting over. And that's the thing a lot of, about a lot of refugees and immigrants, like people have different lives in their homeland. And then here they basically have to like, even even my dad who was in the military, he was like, you know, had the war not happened, I, I was in, on the path to be like a politician, to be someone that actually yeah. has like a standing and to, you know, to, to start over. That's is a very humbling experience. And it's like, sometimes I even like kind of forget that it's like to live in the space where it was like, you know, thinking about, you know, the different side of war and like, you know, all that, what does it mean to kind of like, you know, transition to a culture, a dominant culture that you, you may not, you know, agree with, or even like, you know, considering all the values of, you know, what has happened in the past. When, where and when did you kind of begin to understand all these contextual, cultural contextual clues um, and, and sort of gravitate towards the community and art and at what point in your life does all of this stuff you know because to a lot of people it doesn't matter but uh to you it mattered uh, mattered so much that you sort of went in the direction that the community and, and and art and when did that start to sort of be planted in your mind I mean, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. I can tell you like from different kind of, you know, um, lens, like for example, in the lens of arts, um, I knew at a very young age that that was part of my calling. Like I always, um, you know, sometimes I think about it in terms of like nature versus nurture or like both, but I, I knew at a young age that I was meant to be an artist. Um, even as, as young as, you know, I was in elementary school. It was just like doing art was always something that like, you know, I felt like I was completely in the zone and that it was one of the few things I did when I didn't really think about anything else. I just felt so focused and it came really naturally to me. And, um, you know, I had some art teacher who encouraged me to take classes and um, that in combination with just my curiosity of the world, like I'm very observant. So I'm like, you know, I may not have the language early on, but I was like, I noticed, like I noticed when people were being like horrible to me and my family, I noticed, you know, the glances, I'm just very observant of like, why do like certain people live in a certain area? Why do certain people have, you know, nicer things? So it was just like little things I observed. And then I got into um, youth organizing and like in high school, Mm. middle high school. Um, I had an an older sister who um, got into some of the similar circles and I kind of just kind of like, you know, follow in her footsteps um, or just like attended like workshop, attended different meetings. And so, um, you know, in in high school, I started, you know, um, helping um, the Vietnamese community with voter registration drive, helping, you know, and that was also, you know, in in relation to interpreting for my parents and making sure that, you know, they knew what, you know, what the paperwork was saying, what others were saying. And so that kind of translated into like, me really always wanting to, to help and support and to really make sure that people know what, you know, they're getting into. And so that really translated into, you know, advocacy work, um, also learning about um, Asian American history at, a, at an early age, you know, you know, hearing about all like the crazy stuff that has happened, you know, um, in the in U.S. history, yeah. with, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act, even just like, you know, refugee resettlement, like to, to your earlier point about, you know, when people got resettled in certain like, you know, communities, that was also really intentional too. There was U.S. policy yeah. to make sure that the resettlement of, you know, refugees didn't overwhelm the local community. So it was very intentional. That's why you're like, why are there like, say, the Hmong community in Minnesota? Like there's certain, but it's also very intentional. And of course, you know, families and the community, you know, decide to gather up closer together, but it was very intentional about the very, you know, space that they were being entered. Um, so all that is like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like a coincidence or anything. None of it is accident. Mm-hmm. None of it is an accidental thing. 
When you were um, coming up in high school and, you know, you talked to your parents about becoming an artist or did you ever share that uh, journey with them? It, it wasn't like, oh, I want to be here. Like, I, I love art. I want to be an artist. It wasn't as straightforward as that. I was definitely aware of like, you know, like, you know, the untraditional path, the instability, the, you know, the struggle of being an artist. And um, for my parents, um, on, the, on the one hand, didn't, you know, pressure my um, siblings and I, you know, all that much. It was just like they want us to, you know, be stable, to do well, to like, you know, provide for ourselves. Um, but I was also, you know, a really like different one, you know, you always have that person in the family. I was also um, the fourth of five kids. I was on the, you know, the younger side that so I was able to kind of explore, whereas, you know, my older siblings had to, you know, get that responsibility. Um, I remember, you um, when I think it was like maybe yeah in high school when um I maybe 16 where um there was a program um to go live on um a native reservation and to do like service projects and I had looked it up but it cost like I think like something like crazy like five thousand for like a summer and I I told my older sister about it and she was like you know you can do whatever you want just don't expect our parents to pay for it mm. So I remember that because I was like okay so I decided to just write to them and then they gave me a scholarship. And I was just like, okay, wow. I was like, it's, yeah, it's that easy kind of in, you know, way, but, you know, um, and I, I kind of started doing that. I did that for um, a program actually in between um, high school and college where I went to Vietnam for the first time to do service project. It was another one of those like program where it costs like a bunch of money because it was more catered for like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kids and families with money. So I just wrote to them. I was like, you know, I've never been to you know, back to Vietnam, I would want to do this, blah, blah, blah. And here's my reason. And then they just wrote back and gave me like, you know, a full scholarship and like funding provided. Sometimes you just got to ask. Exactly. And I, I think because of that, those experience, I realized I didn't like, you know, like, you know, in high school, and I was like, you just kind of have to advocate for yourself. Of course, you have to like share your story, your experience, mm -hmm. all that. But the places that have money, they would, you know, if it's, you know, the worst thing you can get is a no, but it's like, there's no, you know, it doesn't bother or hurt to just ask and put it out there. And more often than not, um, it like, I have been, you know, I consider it to myself to be really resourceful. I pretty much like put myself through college, put myself through just so many like opportunity experience because I just kind of went out and kind of navigated that. Um, yeah. <laughs> do, do you ever, um, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about what your parents think of you. <laughs> do, do you ever think about what they thought? Because I, Maybe your dad does know because he has some idea that Boston's a, a hub for education, but Brown and Tish, right? Yes, that's why I went to school. Yeah. They're, yeah, those two schools are not, you know, it's not normal. Um, I think in the sort of uh, Vietnamese culture to think, oh, my kid's going to those schools uh, for art. That's not a normal thing, right? It's pretty uh, outside the box. And But did they understand the value of those um, educational um, places? I would say not fully. Um, I mean, of course, you know, most families, you know, the kind of like the, the Yale, you know, the Harvard kind of, especially in proximity to Boston too. And of course, kind of those, the brand name schools. Um, but I think, um, I think my dad, um, I, I also get a lot of, you know, my, you know, characters and person, you know, from him, like really taking the, the lead. We're actually born two days apart, very, you know, very fiery kind of Aries, um, and so, and really kind of outspoken. Um, but I, I think um, he, he and my, you know, my mom and, you know, I think in some sense they did, did, they did see kind of, you know, the choices I was making and that I was, you know, very much a go-getter. And it's just like, I didn't kind of wait. It was just like what I wanted. I kind of went after. And so in that sense, um, and it wasn't, I was like, hey, I'm going to go study art. I was, there was just so many things I was interested in and curious about. And it, you know, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't as straightforward. It's like, I'm going to go and make a living as an artist. I was also trying to figure it out myself too. And, um, you know, and it wasn't really until after, um, really after like kind of grad school that I was like really thinking about art as, you know, a viable, sustainable way. I was really exploring different, you know, I, I even, I was even thinking about science at first. I was just thinking about mm. like, you know, um, and, you know, international kind of um, relations, just different things. So I wasn't ever like, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to do it no matter what I was, I was trying to be open. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, I chose Brown to that open curriculum that like, you know, um, not having the kind of the requirements and being able to kind of pursue what I want. And I feel like um, I was always someone who like really leaned towards, you know, um, 
having like choices, having, you know, freedom, having not, not being constrained. And so that was more what I was kind of seeking rather than like, you know, being adamant about something particular. You, you know, um, something that is probably not spoken a lot or shared a lot is um, the process of an artist to take a professional path. Can you share with me what are the things that sort of went through your mind when you just said that you kind of made that decision after college? Like what what goes on in someone's mind to say, okay, I'm going to take this course. I want to become an artist professional. Or is it just sort of like, you know what, I'm going to go find a part time job. I'm going to do some pieces on the side and see where that takes me. Or is it much more intentional on a professional track? I think it really depends. Um, I think like, again, there's, you know, like kind of cliche, there's no one size fit all. Um, I mean, I think, um, again, back to the kind of my thing about nature versus nurture is like whatever kind of creative skills. Um, and so I guess one of my thing is that I, I believe everyone is an artist, um, is whether or not we use our creativity. And I believe that, you know, um, arts is a human rights and that, you know, um, we should all have that, you know, that basic kind of access to it. Um, and so, I mean, in, I think being an, an artist, I think kind of the journey is, is different for everyone. I think um, there are some people that, you know, are really like, this is, I know this is the path, I'm gonna do it no matter what. Some people have access to like, you know, family wealth. It's just like, they can go after the unpaid internship. They can go down a certain track without any, you know, thinking about their survival kind of basic needs. And then there, so as you know, certain people like, you know, myself as part of that to think like, you know, is this something that is going to be sustainable? And it's like, um, and for me, like art is, is not something as, you know, and again, there's so many different function, different, you know, utilization of art, art for, you know, art's sake, beauty. Um, I think of it as, you know, a, with, you know, all that to um, healing as a, as a platform to gather, to connect people as really a message, you know, to kind of put forth. And I think the role of the artist is to create possibility um, for life, for the world. Um, and so there's um, kind of in, in all that is it, very much tied to um, very community work, to being an organizer, to really kind of put forth to really, you know, and so um, kind of in that path, I was really narrowing like, you know, um, kind of this, you know, activism route and thinking about, um, you know, um, community rights. Um, and this was, you know, in like, you know, the, you know, 2000 and everything like that. And so, um, there wasn't really a lot of language as there are today, even thinking about this idea of even freelancing of, you know, like side hustle. I think it's Gig just like economy. Every, mm -hmm. exactly all that. So it's just like now it's becoming more prevalent, but back in, it was still that traditional like right. nine to five. And so it's like, I think that's why it's like, you know, people's journey, depending on the era, depending on the time can really, you know, be influenced. And so um, I would say like, I mean, even today I'm still like, you know, juggling is like, do I, you know, um, have that kind of day job to be sustainable? Do I just go out on the limb and pursue kind of what I want? Am I like sustainable? Do I like, you know, it's, it's you know, is this like a risk or is this like a secure kind of, you know, decision-making? So all that still, you know, is actively um, in my mind and always wow. I have to kind of negotiate. And I, I see that in a lot of creatives too, like yourself and so many people around me. And it's just, again, that like negotiation. And, and I think how, the U.S. society, Western, you know, culture value art is so different. It's like almost like on the one hand we value, but on the other hand, it's like with the in industrialized economy, we can order anything instantly. It's like, what is the, you know, it's like people say they value art, but it doesn't always mean they invest in it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with that. And it, it has to have some intentionality, right? Um, if there are no guang there's no um, sort of hubs, uh, community hubs with people with money uh, or intention that foster the artist way, the artist journey. These things are sort of stagnant sometimes because artists can give up and quit because it, it does tax you mentally uh, when you're struggling to kind of figure out money or just putting food on the table. I mean, that's anywhere and everywhere you go. That's going, going to be the thing. But how do you bring utility to, to a place or to a group of people or wherever that's funding? You know, I think that's, is that a question that you have to think about constantly? 
Yeah, I mean, I, yes, I would say so. I would say like intentionality is really important. What is, you know, my goal? What is like my, what am I trying to do with the art that I'm trying to bring forth? Um, one of the things that I thought of when you were um, um, sharing is that, you know, we live in a very capitalistic society and mm-hmm. world, the more and more. And it's like, it's hard to divorce the idea of, you know, money making and sustainability. And um, one of the things I always come back to is that, you know, as, especially in the U.S., um, artists are viewed as, according to, you know, IRS tax law, as small business owner. And so it's like, even with like, you know, you know, not to go into like brass tax about like 1099 or things like that, but it's like, we have to declare ourselves as, you know, profitable or like, or they're, or they're deciding mm-hmm. for us that we're like hobbyists and it's just like something fun. And so it's just like, and in that sense, even like, expenses even like you know say like you know just marketing everything all these little things is like we're essentially like small business even if we're like you know independent kind of you know sole proprietor and so this idea of just like you know being viewed as like a small business owner when I realized that I was like wow there is you know like yes there's something empowering but at the same time it's like the expectation is that like even like one you know freelancer has to do all these things and I'm like so how do you so that's why this like tension or like thing of like there's you know this idea of like having to work multiple jobs and it's just trying to make it work and it's like I I think about that and like you know and then also in different you know culture and society too where it's like the role of the artist they're like it's like a profession you're like the artist and that's what you focus on whereas I feel like now and now I I do worry about you know um and of course, there's such a spectrum. There are very successful artists. If you're right. at the top, you're making so much money. And then it's, you know, unfortunately, if you're not there, it's like you're, you know, kind of having to figure it out. And so it's just like, what is kind of that balance? And it's like, is the expectation, you know, and it's not not just artists, so many people who are juggling too. I mean, the more and more thinking about, you know, the, the gap wealth and everything in our society and world, it's just like, people are really trying to get by and it's just like trying to make it work. Um, and it's like, you know, there are people who do get really lucky, but then there are those who are also very prepared too. I was, um, and, and thinking about kind of the opportunity that, that comes. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, we've talked about this before in a pre-interview call. Um, I think art, Many times, I mean, no matter if you're a singer, director, a fine artist, painter, it's like a pro sport and you have to attack it um, and be diligent at your craft and the way you think of it as a pro sport. Uh, Because otherwise, um, you know, if we don't constantly think of it in that terms especially here in the u.s uh, I, I i think it goes the same in, in vietnam you know we we don't we're not able to sort of sustain and that takes so much energy and dedication and so when i look at somebody like you um young people who have the courage to to step up and and, and pursue this no matter how long it takes or how long you stay in it it is uh it's admirable no matter, no matter how long, or, you know, just the decision to go out and do it because all the things that you said about the IRS and a way that the United States thinks about art, it's not the same as traditionally in Vietnam, our culture, even our parents' culture. I think things are a little bit different now in Vietnam, but in the modern era now, but it's not something that is fostered. You know, it's not something that we are kind of quinket. We're not encouraged or we're not motivated at home to do it. So um, I think anytime we see Vietnamese artists um, going hard at it, like a pro sport, that's like some incredible people. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I definitely agree with that. And I think, and also this idea, what you said about like, you know, when you work at, you know, your craft, it's like, you know, that saying what, um, what you feed into will grow. And of course, you know, again, everyone's journey is different. um, And it's like, just thinking about, you know, And also even like in diaspora community, you know, um, the older generation having to like, you know, and then now seeing more amongst kind of, you know, the younger kind of generation, 
you know, um, more, you know, more variety of like, you know, profession and like endeavors and just like creativity. And it's something that, you know, is very evident in, you know, the type of um, Vietnamese community that, that we see and, you know, kind of the work that's being done, which is, is so powerful and very, very needed. You did a mural on the side of a building. Um, can you tell me about that? Tell me about that project. Yeah, the, the project is... Um, Community in Action, a mural for the Vietnamese people. And it was a, um, a collaborative project I did in 2017. And um, it was right after I, um, I came back from Vietnam. I'd spent um, a year in Vietnam in uh, 2016. And I was, you know, trying to, you know, go back to kind of the Dorchester community in Boston, trying to, you know, get my footing, you know, look for work. And then, you know, funding opportunity came up and I was talking to um, one of the owner of Phá Hoa um, in, in Dorchester, who I'm, you know, I'm still connected to today. Okay. Can I stop and, you right there? What, yes. what do you mean a funding opportunity came up? Like, how does that work? Oh, like, um, like an organization, like it was the, at the time, um, NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, they had like, you know, like a grant opportunity, like they're like $10,000. We want to encourage people to do public art. And so I was like, oh, cool. I was like, um, I think I can like, I would love to, you know, do some kind of project, you know, um, and I was talking to, um, Tam at the time and he was, um, you know, he was like, think about my building and they had just really, um, bought a building for like and stuff like that they're like and he's an artist himself but he you know decided to you know his route was being an entrepreneur and he was like you know I want to collaborate with you just think of my building as like a canvas like you know wow. I'm really and so I was like okay um and then you know I you know this idea of like a mural because you know we can go uh, deep into it but like you know mirrors mirrors are cool but oftentimes they kind of just popped up and it's just like sometimes I don't even know the artist like you know these things and I was like oh what if like I thought about what if I were to do a mural that's you know, really different that's rooted in community organizing that is like really reflective of, you know, the local community and that, you know, my neighbors are a part of it, like both, you know, young and mm. old, different backgrounds, like I want them to be a part of it. And I want them to, um, you know, their vision and to, you know, um, so that when it pops up is they know where it's from, what it's for. And so I really started with that idea. And so, um, yeah, I, um, with the funding, I, I I received the funding. I was able to to hire like a um like an assistant who's who's a and I wanted to make sure that you know that my assistant was from the community. who was like a young high school um, kind of student, and we, we went door to door telling people about the project, telling people how they can participate. I organized like an advisory committee that my neighbors could be a part of. Recruited like youth artists, and we started kind of brainstorming the project. And it took a, po- a total of six months. And um, yeah, it really came together. I wanted to make sure that it was a permanent, you know, um, mural that really showcased um, the Vietnamese um, community. And I, we had like three um, kind of themes to it. It was showcase the Vietnamese narrative, um, share themes of, of unity and, and hope for the future. And especially being in, you know, Dorchester, a working class community. And it's like, you know, all these things that we hear about Dorchester in, in the local news and everything like that. We wanted to kind of counter that and to really invite um, you know, local community members and also vis- visitors to, to learn more about the community and to see what is de- depicted in a permanent way. How did you come up with the, the things that we see in that mural? It was, it was really a collective effort. Like I, mm. um, we had monthly meetings and then, um, I really like, you know, kind of with my organizing kind of background, um, I made sure it was a space where people can really connect. And um, we had like, you know, I had um, older Vietnamese people who were part of it. I had, you know, um, black neighbors. I had white neighbors. It was like, I really wanted to be really reflective um, and young and older. And I, um, we started brainstorming things. There were things that, you know, um, you know, the, the restaurant owner, he was like, no, maybe I want to, you know, um, not have certain things. I, I want it to be for him at the end of the day to, for it to be something positive. I don't want to create controversy. So there was things that was kind of off the bat that he was like, you know, maybe um, don't include this, but like, you know, let's talk about kind of what should we, you know, should be there. And so kind of with that, it was very much that collective. And it was something when people brought something up that someone didn't agree with, we, we, we talked it out. So it was very much like I wanted to make, and I wanted, you know, I made sure there was older Vietnamese people to really make sure like things were, you know, um, it felt right to them. And it was also like historical historically, you know, like, um, accurate to, um, so in actually in the theme of like, if you see the mural, um, it's depicted in a very, um, I know you tell like, you know, lady kind of Liberty kind of the tree. 
Mm. Yeah, kind of. And then she's holding kind of like a book, and it says seventy five. And so it's, mm. we wanted to share this kind of themes of kind of past, present, future, and then paying homage to to you know the ancestors to kind of this this journey of a mother and son kind of arriving. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. That mural is huge. Yeah. How big it's is like, it? It's eight by twenty four feet. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, 24 wide. feet, like height. Yeah. Height. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. Yeah. It's on the side of a building. Yeah. And it's, it's permanent. Sometimes I like literally, I was, I was a little nervous because I was like, I had never done something to that magnitude and like really scaling and all these things. And then, but it, I knew that what I, you know, at the end of it, I wanted to make sure it was something that the community was proud of and that everyone felt like they were a part of it. So that was really, my, really my goal. And I know certain things I was like, because I wasn't in full control of the art, I wanted to make sure people were a part of it. But I was like, you know, at the end, but then I also like, I knew I wanted to be like, you know, like high quality. That's one of the, you know, the thing about like community art sometimes they're like, oh, it's whatever people put together. But I was like, no, I want it to be something that is visually, you know, enhancing and that people feel proud of it. So that was also like a standard that, you know, um, I overseed it. I, di I didn't do everything, but it was like a very much like a collaborative project that came together. You know, I, I can't imagine how happy the, my, the, the building owner, right? I mean, because you have this piece up and it's probably like a big attraction for people who walk by it, right? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, we have the plaque, we have like just, you know, there's been, I've like hosted so many classes, like, you know, even like college classes come over, come there, different, you know, people we like, when we did like um, the grand opening, we kind of had like a, a block party. We invited like, you know, um, yeah, at the time it was um, city council, Ayanna Presley, and then also soon to be kind of current, like um, new mayor now, um, Mayor Michelle Wu. And then we also had, you know, the mayor, it, it was a lot of like, you know, people were really like excited and really like you know really want it was proud of like you know this opening and and the restaurant's still around yeah yeah it's one of the the you know it's a long-standing restaurant that's a staple in the community oh it's been there for a long time yeah been there for oh, a long okay. time and actually one of the things that when i was even um when i was like you know recruiting like neighbors and even after when the project um launched um i had a, especially older um you know um elders vietnamese elders they came up to you know to me and they're like they're like, I'm so proud of you for doing this. Like this really represents, you know, our history. And it was just like wow. really so thoughtful. And they were just like so appreciative. And I was like, you know, I was like, thank you. I like, you know, for just, you know, acknowledge, you know, for everything too. Like, and so it was one of the, the those were the moments that I was just like, wow, like they, you know, really felt like they were seen, like our stories, like a narrative is, is, is out there. Locally. Yeah. It, you know, for all of the older people, you know, you come to this place where you're kind of displaced, you know, in the United States and you're a Vietnamese person, you look differently and you, you feel differently. But then when you're reminded and you have something that connects you to your motherland, your homeland, you know, I can't imagine what feeling that brings to these um, elders in our community. And especially coming from a, a younger person, you know, who came here essentially as a, as a, as a toddler you know, and to kind of like retrace the roots and understanding the, the, the past, present and future and putting that up on a mural so we can connect to that, that that's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I mean, the thing is, is like, oftentimes like, you know, it's like, we look to like, say the younger people, the younger generation, but a part of the project was like, I really wanted to make it intergenerational, you know, mm. like, yeah, there was a lot of young people who were a part of it, but I also wanted elders to be a part of it too. My dad was actually a part of it. And like, I wanted to make sure that I really outreach to the older community. I went to like some of the, you know, the local Vietnamese nursing homes, some of like, you know, the community center, because I wanted really people to know about the project. I went on the local radio too, to let them know. I kind of put like ads out in like the no local newspaper, because it was just like a part of kind of networks and just, you know, it's a small community, but I wanted people to really, you know, know about it and feel like they were a part of it, like in an intergenerational way. Now I'm going to ask a silly question, but it's a technical question. Um, how do you go into something like that, thinking about the longevity of the actual piece sitting outside. And I'm imagining like, that's a very cold, very hot place, right? The, 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 the four swing, seasons. Exactly. four seasons, uh, <laughs> beaming down on the side of that wall and that mural. How do you, how did you, I mean, was that, how do you go into it with that consideration going, I got to keep something up there for many, many years. Like what's the thought process? 
Yeah, I yeah, I definitely did my research. I wanted to make sure like what is like the material like um yeah. and, you know um Thumb the owner he 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 made it kind of plain from the start. He's like, you know, I wouldn't want this to be painted directly on the brick just in case. And I was like, okay, I get it. And then you know, there's something but you know, cuz there's a lot of mural that after a while it like kind of deteriorates it and you fades and the if yeah. you're writing it on a plywood board, I can imagine it bending and, and just warping over time. And then you mount it and you got to take it down after eight years or something, right? Exactly. Like the care, everything, the maintenance, which oftentimes, you know, oftentimes I think a lot of artists don't consider. Not planned. You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, with this, um, I was um, fortunate in that in high school, I was a part of um, kind of some mural making projects and more like, you know, as a youth participant. But I remember... Um, one of the the women who was in charge, she's a, a an arts professor, um, but she actually kind of um, facilitated a mural not too far away, but it was more like like depiction of like local residents. Um, so I I had reached out to her like early when I started thinking about the project, and I asked her about the materials, and then you know I, I researched you know you know what is like sustainable outdoor, especially in the New England area. And she actually gave me um, her name is Mar Marguerite Rack, and she gave me some really solid advice. She was like, you know, I really recommend uh, dye bond material, which is the material on street signs, you know, like the stop signs like the highway uh -huh. sign. And she's like, yeah, these materials are so durable and you can paint on it and it really last like up to 20 years. So I was like, what is oh, it made of? Dye, like, um, I don't know what that, I mean, it's called dye bond, dye bond. Dye bond and, yeah. and dye bond boards. And is it like fiberglass or is it uh, plastic, resin? Wood? I don't know too much about the details of that, but I do know it's like very, it's almost like, it felt, feels kind of like a metal, a little bit, a very thin metal, you know, but like very, you know, like, like think about the stop sign and stuff like that. But yeah, I was just like, wow. And um, so, and then I was like, how do I source this? And she was like, yeah, there's some companies like, like upstate stuff like that. So I was like, let me look into this. And then, um, yeah. And then I looked into like, you know, the different kind of acrylic, she's like, acrylic paint is really good. Just make sure kind of, you know, you, of course, like, you know, coat. paint to like gesso it, make sure you have like a, an, a coat, an overcoat. And like, think about like, uh, um, what's that thing? Like a, is it turpentine? Yeah, turpentine. I think I have some actually in my studio right now. Um, yeah, just to overlay it for like the top coat. And so I was like, okay, maybe um, actually maybe with this is actually even more um, sustainable because again, I had at the time I didn't have experience even doing like large scale mural. I was like, what do you, how do you, do you get a lift, a platform? I don't even mm -hmm. know how all that works yeah. in the outdoors. I have to really plan it for like the warm summer months. So um, kind of understanding this kind of panel idea, I was like, oh, maybe this is helpful. I maybe thinking about like a space wise and Tam offered me um, really the basement of his restaurant. It was huge. She was like, Tran, you can like, this could be like the studio, you know, space and stuff. So I was like, okay, maybe this is actually going to work out because then I'll, I feel like I'll have a lot, you know, more control, like actually painting on the panel as opposed yeah. to like painting on the surface of the building. And so, um, yeah, it was the hard, the thing was during the course of the project, it was more the brainstorming and like, you know, that took the long time, like almost five months. And then we, we painted, we all painted in like the basement, like the last like three weeks and like, wow. we, we sketch it out. We like, you know, use like, you know, painter's tape, everything. I like gesso it. And then I, I even have like, I did a time lapse to see, you know, how the process was, was you know, done and yeah. Oh, cool. I'd love to get to, to, to see that. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really. And then you can see like people who were involved. Like I had my family come. I had like, you know, young people, elders, everyone came and like, you know, you see like really it coming together. But um, but yeah, all to say is, I mean, the material was definitely a big consider any consideration. And then even at the end, um, we had hired like, you know, someone to help us like, you know, get a lift and like, mount it basically mount it to the, the, um, the building, which was a, a whole thing. I was like, wow, I had no idea that this, all these parts were, you know, like, yeah. And, and to this day, it's, it's been like, you know, five years, four or five years now, and it's, it's still fading. there. And it, it's fading. like literally like, it's still as like vibrant and like the color hasn't faded at all. And wow. I think it was a testimony to like the top coats and the materials, everything. We were really careful about that. Okay. 24 by eight. Is that one piece or did you have to buy three or four pieces and join the back of it we we bought a bunch of pieces i, I think all together right now i think it's i think it's like eight pieces like all online 
I think, yeah, but each, um, yeah. So we like did it. So the idea was at first I was like, oh, do I want like kind of like the whole side of the building? Like we had some ideas around like, you know, the imagery say of a tree kind of thing. And then um, we decided on like almost like a scroll. So down middle. And then we actually, as part of the design, we actually want it to be like, you know, that kind of, you know, the really Asian scroll, like mm-hmm. at the top and bottom. But actually at the last minute, um, we decided to take that out because it was just like too much for the art because there was so much already that kind of at the last minute, we were like, me and Tam were looking at it and we're like, you know, maybe this is not, it's going to, dis- uh, you know, attract people, even though it's beautiful. Like we kind of did like um, Zodiac animals, like mm. Vietnamese Zodiac and everything, but we decided to take that out because um, it was just, it was just too much for like kind of the visual. Um, so yeah. So we decided at the end to kind of do that kind of scroll like, but we took out kind of the top and bottom. That piece looks much more than $10,000. <laughs> I know. I was when just I'm like, lis- I, when yeah. I'm listening to you, I'm like, this is much more than $10,000. It definitely, I'm, I'm very resourceful. So we, we actually got some, a little bit more funding at the end for like to put on like the block party, okay. put on like little things, but like, I'm very like, like I, you know, didn't pay myself much. And, you know, I made sure my um, assistant was paid. Oh, the, a big part of it was like, I made sure that everyone was, who was a part of the project was paid too. Like mm. they, they received a, like an honorarium stipend because um, I wanted to, you know, really values people's time yeah. and to make this something that really kind of, kind of consider people's, you know, like, you know, um, work. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, it was like, I was able to do it in like the amount of, you know, and then at the time I was, you know, juggling like, you know, a day job and everything too, but like, it really came together in like, you know, um, accordingly. So based on our conversation, I know that you, um, had some part in the documentary uh, by Ken Burns last days in Vietnam. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so the documentary wasn't by Ken Burns. It was actually by um, Rory Kennedy. The documentary, it was um, Last Days in Vietnam. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. All good, all good. So this was 2015. But yeah, Ken Bonner Burns had his series after. Um, So in 2015, um, I signed on to this project um, as part of um, PBS American Experience um, to do outreach um, for the the documentary, uh, Last Days in Vietnam, Um, but then really to facilitate a storytelling um, oral history project um, with the Vietnamese community. Um, And we have partnered with StoryCorps and we outreach to primary two audience, um, the Vietnamese um, community, diaspora community in the U.S. in six different cities, and to um, you know American veterans who were um, a part of a part of the war. And so, um, yeah, the project was really to bring um, you know people together to interview one another. So instead of like a typical like you know a journalist or someone from you know the outside coming in to talk people, ask people about their experience, the project was to have family members connect to one another, um, you know, social workers, people who was a part of, you know, um, helping to, um, you know, resettle the Vietnamese community, have be a part of that conversation where we actually connected, um, you know, people like some sponsor family with one another. And then they just really talked it out. I, my family was a part of the project. Uh, My sister had interviewed my dad. It was like really a way. um, And it, it, the project really came out of, um, there was, we did a fundraising right after kind of the film um, and because at towards the end of the film and of course no spoiler or anything, but um, you know, the last scene was that, you know, we see the imagery of, you know, the Vietnamese boat people, you know, who have it been and then where everyone, you know, especially people who don't know the experience, they're like, Oh, what happened? What, what kind of happens after? And even like the, you know, um, Vietnamese, um, you know, young people, they're like, we, you know, want to understand kind of all these things. So we did the, um, the fundraising and the kind of, um, to really, you know, document, you know, stories and that, right. you know, really that came out of it is like kind of what happens and how do we really preserve these stories? Um, so that was how kind of the, the oral history project. How, how did you get um, asked to get on that project? Um, I guess applied directly. I think a, a friend of mine, um, he's, you know, um, is like, I think an academic Vietnamese, like in um, the Boston area, but he just, you know, forwarded to me. And at the time I was, you um, living in New York. I was, um, I had finished uh, my grad school studies um, and I was just working in New York for a couple of years. And then I, w- I wanted to, you know, kind of um, eventually kind of move back to Boston or just like, you know, really 
create my own kind of work. Um, and, and so this kind of opportunity came up and I, I felt like I kind of fit a lot. They were, you know, really looking for someone who was connected to the community, someone who could do outreach and really kind of, um, believe in, you know, um, the project. And so, yeah, I just applied directly. And I think, um, they, they, I mean, desperately needed someone who was Viet- actually Vietnamese mm-hmm. to be a part of the project. Cause you know, in like a lot of, you know, um, public media scene that, you know, I've been a part of, it's just for the most part, it is very, very white. And so they, for a project like this to be successful and to be effective, they, they have to have like, you know, Vietnamese, at least a Vietnamese person to really support the out, with the outreach. You, you know, something that is um, a consistent theme in your life is you go out and apply for stuff, <laughs> you know, and that says a lot because you know, we, we often think that we're going to get discovered. I'm, I'm not saying we, but collectively as human beings, sometimes we think that things will just come, things will just, you know, fall into our lap. But, you know, we have to go out and, especially as artists, we have to go out and initiate, we have to apply, and we have to fill out these forms, right? We have to put so much intentionality, it goes back to that, right? Intentionality plus this sort of effort uh, energetically to go out and apply for something and just sit and wait. And it's a journey constantly having to do that. It's, it's true. And I've gotten rejected so many times that I almost sometimes it doesn't phase me. I'm just like, okay, next, next, but you know, of course, like it is like exhausting. It is, you know, that, that process, but I, I find that, um, you know, with opportunity, creative ones, again, it's like, yeah, we can't afford to just, you know, sit back but it's just like you know the bigger risk the bigger rewards and it's just like um you know like what people can you know like the worst that can happen is a no but it's like what people actually regret most in life is things that they didn't try for rather than you know the rejection it's yeah it's true it's true but that energy to go out and keep doing it again and again and again you just have to have so many uh projects in the air so you know when something pops off you you get it it, it is exhausting though. Like I would say, like, um, I tried really hard when I was like applying to like scholarships for like college. And then actually after that, I actually took like a break because I felt like I got tired of just like sharing my story and just almost like marketing myself. And especially to, you know, the places that have money or oftentimes it's a very like, you know, you know, white kind of gaze. And I just felt so tired of having to like, you know, share my story and like, you know, um, so I actually, I took a break and then now, you know, it's, you know, it's been different, of course, like more, you know, back then it was really much like my story to like get into like, you know, college or certain things. Um, and then now it's of course more about like infusing with arts and like kind of my vision, but I, I, you know, I still get like tired, but it is a really exhausting process. And again, it's that, again, this kind of like, you know, you it, like there are people and I've gotten, you know, really like strong at like grant writing, you know, sharing kind of what I have and all these things, but it's still like a process. And mm. it's like some people can are able to break into that and some people aren't. And so that also differentiate people who can have access to resources and opportunities to. Um, yeah, right, right. Um, you've been back to Vietnam uh, probably a few times, right? Yeah, I've actually kind of starting to lose, tra- lose track. Um, <laughs> I try to go every few years and I usually go by myself. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, what, I, um, yeah, go ahead. What was it like the first time for you to go back? And, and I want to know sort of what your parents thought and what they said, you know, going back. Was it with them the first time or? No, it was with uh, when I got that um, opportunity to go back and do service projects when I got the grant too. Um, it was something I actually, I wanted to kind of give that gift to myself, like right after like high school. And I had actually, I was dreaming about Vietnam. I was like, um, I had all these like kind of dreams and it was like very, that kind of that nostalgia kind of in like the feel and like the water Buffalo, but there was something that I was just like, wow, like I have to like, and I, like I left when I was four. So there was very little things that I remember, but I was still able to piece some stuff together. But then I felt like at the time I was like, you know, 18, um, I kind of had, like, I was like, I, I want to have like a real reference of Vietnam and not just, you know, through the images and film, but I want to see it for myself and connect with my family who are there. Um, so I went back at first, you know, it was like the first five weeks was I was kind of traveling throughout the country with like, you know, 
um, Vietnamese, you know, American, more like Americans um, kind of students to like do service project and went to like orphanage. We went to like, you know, we're teaching just different things just throughout the, and I stay with like a host family and like, you know, the, on the North and everything. Um, and then I, um, I met up with my, with my family in, in, you know, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. And um, yeah, it was definitely really surreal. I was just like, wow, I, met, I saw my grandmother and like my aunts and uncle. And I was just like, wow. wow. And, How old were you um, then? 18. And I, I felt, I, I, and I stayed like a little bit, like a, maybe an extra week just to like spend time with them. But it was definitely really like, you know, a little awkward because I was like, wow, like they know of me, but I don't really, you know, know, I know of them, but not so much. And it was like, I, like, I just put myself there. I was like, I'm just going to live with, you know, even for a week. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it was, I was really like, you know, proud of myself, especially, especially like the transition from like high school to college, but then you just even have that, you know, the opportunity and like, you know, of course um, there's just, it's a lot. And one of the things I, I know earlier when you asked me, what was it like growing up? I think a part of that was also like my family, we didn't have any relatives here with us, which is, you know, like, a, you know, a lot of, you know, um, refugee and immigrant um, share that experience, but I didn't grow up with any like you know, anyone outside of my immediate family. So all my aunts, uncle, cousin, everyone was in Vietnam. So it's like, I was, I thought about when I was there, I was like, wow, sometimes I do wonder what, what it would have been like to grow up with like your extended family around you. And so whenever I go back to Vietnam, I think about that. I'm like, wow, like it's just people, you know, and like people come to each other's house like all the time. It's not like only like for special occasion, of course, like now, like, you know, um, society and culture and everything like that. But it was just like people came over every day. It was like nothing. It wasn't like for like a certain occasion or something. What, what a luxury, right? Think about yeah. that. Yeah. Your extended family, you know, 20, 30, 40 people living in the same neighborhood or whatever. And they're just coming over for sugar or a mango or whatever, you know, it's like, what a luxury. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. but you know, oftentimes too, like in the United States, we have these, I have a big, I come from a big family, um, but we're so polarized at the same time now, you know, uh, 45 years later, mm -hmm. hardly any of us are talking to each other because we're so, I don't know, Americanized, we're so individualized, we all have our political leanings and the sense of community is gone within that original family structure that came in the 70s and 80s with my parents. It's like uh, we hardly see each other, the cousins don't see each other. And uh, it's just because, you know, we all have families and we all have disbanded and, and, and moved around the country. But I think about how warm and how wonderful you know and and you know there's a lot of drama i'm sure too mm. you know but it's it's a beautiful way of life i think it's true and i mean there's a lot of you know reason too it's like yeah that people are more mobile um people don't live in the same community that they grew up in even thinking around like migration and like displacement yeah. is really rare for like people and you know collectively throughout the world to like mm -hmm. and there's such privilege to grow up in the same and to live in the same space that you you know you grew up in and I think um yeah I mean I think this idea of family as, as a village as a tribe has has just shifted in so many ways and even my dad he was telling me like you know um you know once he was like you know I feel like it'd be so it's so hard to raise kids these days in the U.S. Like it's so much work. Like he sees my sister, and he's just like he's like I mean he's like I have five kids, but you know it was like there was like extended family to support one another. But here it's just like parents are expected to do everything and be everything, and it's just like he's like this is a lot of work. He's like I don't think I would could have be able to mm -hmm. like raise five kids today. It's like so much work. And um, actually, I was not to like reference my project, but one of my project that I, um, and I'm still continuing to work on is the Viet family stories. And that is, you know, the idea of that is a multimedia to really integrate um, families and stories, you know, um, from the, you know, the Vietnamese household is this idea of of sharing, you know, stories that, and things that we don't talk about within families and how do we kind of make that more open. And so Tell that's about idea. that project. Yeah, so I it was another another grant that it was like it started in 2018, and this was you know pre um, pandemic, and so um, it was really idea to you to experiment with uh, theater and like um, performances to tell kind of stories and to inspire like more dialogue, 
And so um, at the time I recruited like six, um, about six um, Vietnamese um, artists in the local Dorchester area to really put together like vignettes, like little performances mm. um, to share on stage and into, into an audience of the community. And I was, you know, inspired by, of course, like, you know, um, cultural stuff like Paris by night or like performances. And I was like, music is so integral in the Vietnamese community. And like, that's what every time there's a gathering or celebration is always like music performances when people like put on things. And I was like, oh, I was really inspired. I was like, how do I use that? But to shift it to talk about really like, you know, heavy topics like trauma, like um, expectation, like um, in the family, like, um, you know, sharing things that people don't, you know, that consider they're like, oh, no, we can't talk about that out loud kind of thing. So I was like, how do I kind of utilize that, you know, cultural kind of, you know, toolkit to kind of share to right. uh, facilitate more dialogue so um yeah I worked with a team a group of you know six artists we like um wrote plays together and like spoken word cool. poetry bilingually be- again and I wanted to make it into generation not just like young people thing but I wanted you know elders to be a part of it too we love we love and everything like that so um and I, I made sure that it was bilingual because I, I wanted to be something to facilitate dialogue with young people and also elders together so right. everything we um we made sure it's in English and Vietnamese. And then um, we put together kind of a showcase. There was like over 200, you know, people showed up. We had food, everything on like a Saturday. And I was, I was you know, nervous because I was like, um, I, you know, some of the topic was really heavy. We had an artist who talks about his story about coming out to his mom. And then um, later on, um, he actually uh, transitioned to, um, you know, and, and became a she. And then, um, and I did the iteration again in 2020, actually um, in pandemic over kind of Zoom mm-hmm. and um, the same artists talk about, you know, their transition. And so I was really nervous about how that was kind of come off or like um, I had another artist talked about um, his um, dad's um, PTSD because trauma and not like, you know, mental health. And then, um, and then I, I had this amazing like, um, older Vietnamese um, man who's like, he, he used to be like, you know, a singer, like a songwriter. And he actually wrote a skit around just expectation that he was putting on his own, you know, kids. And then like wow. him, him wanting to like move back to Vietnam. Cause he's like, I'm so done with America. And so it was like really amazing. And he's so down and he actually did like, you know, he numbed her and everything. Mm. And, um, but he was so down. He was like, yeah, I want to be a part of this. I want to like showcase and just, uh, you know, all the contradiction and everything too. And, um, and it was so well received. Of course, there were moments it was also difficult too. But I also, another cool thing that I incorporated was that I made sure um, there was table discussions after. So wow. I had um, brought on uh, Vietnamese social workers, like bilingual social workers to help facilitate the conversation and to have vocabularies that people can really talk about. And so um, to make sure, you know, to create like safe, but also brave spaces to make sure people, you know, felt like they were, you know, um, you know, it was like really shared. And so, um, yeah, I was super nervous, but that actually came came off and then people were so excited. They're like, when when is this more going to happen kind of thing? It's amazing because you're building up this compressed air in this space, like a compress, a compression tank, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have a release valve. And by bringing in this sort of like this time in this space after the performance, you allow people to kind of like just let it dissipate and process out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so genius. Where did you get that from? What where, uh, what, what, what inspired that? I mean, I think a lot of it comes from, um, I think, my training as an organizer and seeing thinking about workshops, what mm-hmm. I have facilitated, seeing like really like amazing facilitator think about how do we open up discussion? How do we create and hold spaces for people? And, um, and yeah, I mean, I think um, even when art is, you know, brought out, you know, has messages, but it's just like people are kind of left to their own devices. You can talk to people, you know, all these things, think about it for a minute, or maybe they'll have impact on you later on. But it's like really um, protecting kind of that moment that is really shared publicly. And, and I, I really consider my art um, as part of, you know, that socially engagement mm-hmm. kind of creative placemaking and to really um, see it as a form of community, part, you know, participatory and that it really activates and, and connect, you know, gather people. 
um, and engage people. And so um, with that, I really wanted it to be kind of that, you know, the learning opportunities from, from you know, all different sides. It wasn't just like, hey, we're presenting something to the audience so they can learn. But it was like a lot of the experiences that we share on stage. It was like almost like all like Vietnamese people in the audience could really connect with. And it's like, right. when you talk to any like Vietnamese person, it's like everyone has their story. And that, that was what I also learned from like the oral history project, you know, with the PBS. It's also like, and that's the legacy of like, I think the Vietnamese diaspora. If you talk to anyone about like hardship and resiliency and like pain, like everyone has their stories. And so it's just like, it was, yeah, we spotlighted these say six stories, but it was just like, I want it to open up because everyone had their story. And how do we, you know, really tie that into like the greater collective? It's beautiful. I, wa <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody on the West Coast thinking like this, you know, <laughs> we could use it. Definitely. I mean, I know you've like had so many amazing guests and I've like listened to some of the interview D van who's doing amazing gathering like art like it literally it's like thing is it's just the more and more it's like I almost see like this not like it's not the same narrative but just like you know similar in parallels across different diaspora and it's just like and, and unfortunately it's just like the cost of war that kind of creates this and it's just like I just don't want us you know we're continually getting into that same pattern of like you know like that you know this happens and then this and then people learn from it but I'm like yeah like all this is you know part of the human experience it's beautiful but it's just like at the same time it's also really like messed up that it keeps on happening and it's because of you know results of terrible policy of very like you know um ways of like power privilege in the world capital just so many ways I'm like yeah things that can you know, come out of it in a beautiful way, but at the same time, did all this have to happen in the first place? Or like, how do we kind of prevent it from happening? So, or like, you know, to create less pain for, for ourselves? Yeah. It's, God, I hate, hate to be so pessimistic about this stuff, but it's cyclical. It's um, greed. It's humankind just doing it over and over and over again. And it affects a group of pe people, millions of people that then they have to uproot and find new homes. This is the history of mankind, you know, unfortunately, that's, we don't learn. I think it's just greed. And we're, we're you know, a lot of us are programmed to, to go out and, and really just do things so selfishly without thinking about, or no, they probably do think about it and they don't care. It's you like know? intentional. It's like when they say it's like, you know, it's like the system is not broken. It's designed no, to be it's designed. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. And can we learn from it? Yeah, we can learn from it. But, you know, I mean, you learn from it. These generations that come and go and come and go and throughout the millennium, it's just part of our animalistic predatory ways and you know it's but it's getting less and less if you think about it though as modern uh history uh continues you know it's not as brutal and so much warfare that's happening that uh that creates you know the vietnam war is just greed i mean there's no more it's just that simple i hate to simplify that it was just a matter of people have interest countries have interest and they're just gonna go and do it and um God, you know, we see it with Afghanistan. Hmm. Yeah. These and it's things... also very, like, like you said, very, sh like, just like short attention span. Like people don't learn or they don't want no. to learn. And so it's like, for me, I'm like really interested in like, what are the ways that we like can, can really preserve the memories, but then also like thinking about not just on like kind of that, you know, that physical kind of human level but it's like how do we connect to this lineage mm -hmm. and i think so much of you know the vietnamese community and diaspora and culture is about you know that connection to our ancestor and connection to um you know that continuation that like and you know and 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 even you know put it friendly like a death isn't always the final you know you know the decisive like what continues and it's just like you know we've been around, people have been around, but it's like, what, what is the growth? What is that, you know, cyclical, even that what, what you mentioned. And um, because sometimes I'm like, yeah, all this is, is again, it's, it's really not new. And it's just like, mm -hmm. what is, what keeps it going? And then what also like can break kind of that cycle and patterns too. 
I'll tell you what's new to me is the, maybe it's not new, but I feel like the United States on some weird level, the people have this, not everyone, obviously, but there, there are pockets of humanity in the United States that understand that, look, this part of the country really fucked it up. This part of the country really went after these people, but we have an obligation and a responsibility to make things right. And, you know, that is something that we are the benefactors of, right? In some strange way, we um, have benefited from the goodness and the kindness of sponsors and people who are here in the United States, you know, in the seventies that realized that their government really did uh, horrible things in Vietnam and, you know, they, they really stepped up and, you know, my family was recipients of, of this love and this care. And across the country, there's a lot of people who are part of that, you know, um, the intake of, of, of Vietnamese refugees. So I don't want to I don't want to forget that, too, that the humanity that ha- has come from the American people in pockets that have taken care of the Vietnamese people. Yeah, I mean, it's true. And then I um, I remember in one of my um, classes, uh, it was like one of the professors said this really idea of colonialism is like, we are here because you were there. You know, this idea of like, you know, um, and and it's, it's, it's tough because um, actually right now I'm, I'm, I'm helping, I'm supporting this, you know, um, Af- Afghani, Afghani family, but it's like, when I talk to them sometimes, it's like, they're, they're also really pissed too. And it's like, I don't want to go into this narrative again of like, you know, the grateful refugee or the grateful immigrant, because it's like a lot of it is really like fucked up. And it's just like, you know, there can be multiple, you know, kind of, you know, like truth and like complexity. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you're like helping me right now, but I'm also pissed that like, it's like your Absolutely. government, you know, all these things. And it's just like, it's, it's a lot to, you know, to, to hold too. It's just like, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't, you know, talked to my dad to this extent and stuff like that. But in like, like, that's one of this one of the conversation for a lot of like Vietnamese elders, I really want to explore, but it's this idea of like, you know, being pissed, but then also grateful. And like, of course, you know, and um, like even for um, the, the Afghani um, mother that I'm um, kind of, you know, um, helping with just like, you know, resources and like her son. And she was like, you know, if it was me. I would not go to the US. I want to stay behind and continue fighting. Like, but I have to think about my my son and this is, you know, like for his future. But he's, she's like, if it was just me, I would not go. Like I would have stayed. Yeah. 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 Being plucked from your, your homeland. It's just, not and it's just, even just yeah. yeah, considering just every, you know, all this stuff that's like kind of ongoing. But yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, definitely it's, it's a lot, but it's like really to say that when, again, the, the narrative that keep playing again and again, and it's just like, but where does that, you know, how does that continue to be up, you know, upheld and how, what is like the role of the artists and the cultural, you know, makers to like, you know, to both expose this, but also like to like really provide, I think like possibilities and like you know really that you know that growth and like that learning too. Mm-hmm. on one of these trips you did a pilgrimage for a thing called Landong, right yes. how did you even get that idea to do it what led you to that yeah so um that was in 2016 i um i was part of the pilgrimage it was uh Viet Han Kien in Hue and um it's just, I mean, I'm just always like linking back. Just, I feel like, again, what we said earlier is like, you know, most things aren't a coincidence. Like if I felt like I was, you know, supposed to be there and it, it didn't just happen like, you know, that one trip, but it was, um, so the first time I was back in Vietnam, um, one of the things that I was really um, interested in this when I was 18 is that, that, you know, always like it's a part of me and like other, you know, experience and work is a, it's really healing and thinking about healers. And so when I was 18, actually, um, we had to do like an independent project, um, which was part of that kind of that group. And my, um, the project that I wanted to do was around um, connecting with local healers. And so um, I like, had met so many Vietnamese healers, people who like, you know, did palm reading, people who like literally would, you know, um, you know, working with spirits, just different types of, you know, healing in Vietnam, like um, very like, like indigenous um, native. And um, I had met, um, you know, a healer and from Da Nang. 
And um, yeah, I like, I, I like, I always, I asked around, so I didn't want to just someone who like promoted himself. I really wanted to go deep into like, you know, the village and like ask people who are like, who are the people that you go to? And like, you know, of course, you know, I can, I know Vietnamese, so I was able to, you know, um, have access to that. But then, um, so I, um, I met this healer and she was one of those people that I had to like ask around. And um, fast forward, I stayed in touch with her till like 2016 when I was like 18 to like, you know, and I've like, um, did I meet, like, I think maybe I did another trip in between or other things where I've like kept up where I've like, I I got her phone number and we were like, you know, but, um, but in 2000, I was able to like, you know, lived in Vietnam. So I like, um, actually like spend time with her and she invited me. She was like, you know, and she told me about this, actually this trip, like back when I was 18, but I was like, I don't know. I was like, this, she basically said there was people who levitated and she showed me pictures and I was like, what? And I was just like, (laughs) <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You saw pictures of people levitating? Yeah and, yeah. and was it real? Yeah, it was real. I was just like, I don't think she's like trying to make it up or anything. It's like she literally, she was like a healer. She was like telling me stuff and she was like, I want to take you to this like pilgrimage one day. And I was just like, okay. I was like, yeah. Wait, what? What? Because you hear that throughout history, right? Of people levitating. Yeah. Now, if it didn't ever really happen, how could people talk about that, right? Like, yeah. Do- so, and, and I don't want, again, you know, esoteric, all these things, but I think is I've been in different circles where I've say like seen magic, you know? And so I've, it's not like completely like different for me. So I was like, okay. And I was, there's a reason I was drawn to. And, um, but anyway, so that was kind of the backstory. So as she was, um, so as part of this pilgrimage, it's like an annual gathering. This is the biggest pilgrimage where it's part of the mother goddess, um, Le Mao, Mao tradition, mm-hmm. where um, people really honor um, the mother goddess and also honor like past, like, you know, kings and queens and like Vietnam, like imperial, you know, and there's such like lineage to that. And so I was like, and it, you know, have you, you know, you know about like Linda when stuff people dress up and they like perform um, and it's so like actually I'm like if I ever like get my doctorate this is what I would be studying about like there's so much history there and it's so connected to other uh, culture too um very that like you know um yeah so um but I was like I was always like just like both fascinated but I was just like wow there's so much like the fact that people dress up people you know basically give out money like they have like such a following like it's such like a like a deep rooted, like, you know, um, religion. Yeah. It's a, it's a religion, like traditions, all these things too. Um, but she had told me, she was like, yeah, this, uh, she's like, um, thousands of like, um, they're on the, they have the, the dragon bolts on the river, the Hoya wow. river. And so they gather throughout the country and it's like, you have to, um, travel with your temple and it's like, people pay a lot of money and it's very much like, you know, and they they even have like Cause it's, it's such like a, like a money making kind of thing. So there's a lot of like eyes on it and like people like, you know, businesses connected, but it's like, she's like, yeah, I travel every year with my temple. Cause I'm like the head of it. She was like, you should come. And I was like, oh my, I was like, yeah, like, let me, let me think about it. Let me like try to, and she, I was like, cause I was like trying to ask, I was like, what are, like, where do, what, where do we stay? She's like, everyone just sleeps on the boat. Like literally is like. <laughs> you like to, I was like you just live on the boat for a week we'll have food we'll have everything we have like the altars just just, just come and you'll see and so I was like okay so um I planned it I think it was like around um like around the end of July kind of August time summertime and then um and and so because of that and I wanted to spend some time in Hoya so I ended up like to really living in Hoya for like a couple months because there's so much you know arts and tradition there and so um I decided to, to document um kind of my and I asked her I was like is it okay if I uh, photograph document she said yeah of course and then um and it, I mean it was also obvious I don't you know I I stand out, you know, as like a very not non like, you know, local Vietnamese person, like even the way I dress, of course, come off. But then she was like, you're my guest, don't worry. And so she really like, you know, like um, guided me and really protected me because there were definitely is very insulated. So like I got it was like I was surrounded by all the local Vietnamese and they definitely gave me weird looks. They're like, why are you here? All these things. But she really she's like, no, she's my guest. Like she's here. And then um, and then so, um, yeah, the pilgrimage, it really like there was there's almost like a uh almost like a route that people do. And so um, 
her um her temple from Danang was one of like the temple that came really early and so we like did almost like the stops we like pay homage to like certain temples that belong to the mother goddess and like went on like different routes to pay like you know and then we saw other like um people journeying too they brought gifts they brought you know one of those things where they have like you know kind of like the new year time when they they brought like the paper houses and the paper cars to like to like on to like um, as an offering to like ancestor that uh, that help kind of bless their families and so there's all these like you know and I you know documented all of it and then um, going to like different temples and then as part of you know the religion and as part of the kind of is very ritual um, people go into trance like like they immerse themselves mm. into trance and so um, my my mentor she's like. And now I like literally like I, I should I actually get in touch with her again. Um, but she's she's getting up there. She's like almost like 70, almost 80 now. But she was like in a trance for like literally like six, seven hours. And it's wow. like once people get immersed into it, she like doesn't she completely transform. And so it's like that's why it's like really interesting about even like gender bending. Like, you know, she dresses up as a king, she dresses up as a queen, as like everything in her outfit. She has like people like her entourage helping her and everything. And it's like every like a uh, boat has that. Um, who said there's like a famous um, you know, the famous um comedian? He he's fa- like in Vietnam and he he had his own boat and he had like it was a big boat, you can tell. It almost, it almost reminds me of like, you know, Burning Man. <laughs> like people in their tents and I was, I was out to like a burner and stuff too and so it was just like very much like you can tell what it's like the fancy boats the boats that have money versus like the more like <laughs> basic boats but it's just like it's like a whole thing and um it's a whole culture yeah it's a whole culture and so to be a part of that and yeah to just like experience it to witness it it's just like so incredible and that goes on every year it goes on every year. I'm not sure during the pandemic, they may have paused it and everything, but it's something that, you know, kind of like the government even watches out for just because it's, it generates so much business. What's the and name like, of it officially? Um, Le Dien Hong Kien Festival. Yeah, there's, I mean, mm. if you look, um, you know, stuff in like, there's a lot of Vietnamese uh, articles that's written about it. You can even like YouTube it as a video recording, but it's like to really understand the festival. It's like, you have to kind of know people, but it's like, there's been like, you know, documentation of it. Um, it's like, how have I been living this long and didn't know that there's an actual festival for that, right? There's a lot. That's the thing. Like even my year in Vietnam, there was just like so much stuff that I learned. And that's when it's like, you know, when like, you know, versus visiting and it's like, it's just so much like depthness. And it's like the more, and that's what I really like love when it's like, you really like, you know, get deep into it. There's so yeah. many things that it's like, has yet to uncover. That's almost a differentiate between like very surface versus like really depth and like really building like relationship. I mean, the reason, cause I knew her since I was 18, she wasn't just going to like invite anyone random, but it's like, I had, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't even thinking I'm going to, you know, one day all these things, but it was just like, there's certain things that I feel like is really meant to be. And there's a reason why I was there. And there's a reason why it's just like, sometimes I don't even understand the full picture or vision yet and it kind of reveals itself in different ways that that's fantastic to you know go into an uh, a situation with an open mind and yeah. coming out you know just being open and not allowing the story to kind of unfold in front of you yeah yeah i really appreciate you opening up today and, and telling me about your life and you know it's fascinating the work that you do and the risk really it's the risk that you take with your future and the belief that you're doing the right thing because it takes a lot of courage as, as an artist to, to really do this stuff. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Ken. It's been really, really a wonderful conversation that I wasn't even sure what angle it was going to lead to, but it just felt so natural. And I so appreciate, you know, you're asking the questions, engaging with me on these really like critical topics and conversation. And I, you know, just admire the way that you you connect with all your guests. And I was just like, wow. And like just the openness of it. So definitely really appreciate that. Well, thank you for that. Those are kind words. I, re- I really appreciate it. You know, I what I learned today was um, this idea of art and community, because typically when I think about art, I, sometimes I think about, you know, as a singer, you have to train and you, you're going to go on stage. There's a, there's a real clear monetization uh, goal, kind of build up the, the, the audience, you build up the fans as a director, as a writer, film writer, book writer, you know, but what you do is a unique thing that I didn't know about. I'm sure that people like you exist, artists like you exist, but what I learned today is being 
um, an artist can be, uh, this shape of an artist has its utility, right? For the community. And it's a like a bonding, your bonding agent for the people around you. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I want to, I mean, I do care about like sustainability too. So it's not all like, oh, I'm just, you know, and um, something that came up is like, like for me, like art is so central to who I am that like part of me continuing on this route is that it, it like feeds and nourish me so much. Like I, there's been time when like, you know, I try to like, okay, maybe I just, you know, don't want to think about it, do something else. But it, it always like, I always have this feeling that something is missing. So it's like, I don't, you know, feel whole with myself unless I'm like constantly integrating art into like my life and practice. So there's a part of me that if, if for me, it feels so <clears throat> interconnected that I have, you know, it like is a part of me. So like, I don't want to give people the impression that it's like, oh, I'm doing this for all these sake and like, you know, all these things like, yes, that, but then I also, I like, I get so much from it too. Yeah. As I'm thinking about where I live um, specifically, I feel like I don't, I haven't walked around in my mind where I can zone in on, on a piece that I'm like, Oh my God, that's my community. Right. And I think about like, there's a place in Beverly Hills here in LA called Rodeo drive. I don't know if yeah, anybody's know heard it. of it. Yeah. Um, and, and when you walk through it, like we, I drove my kids uh, through that area this weekend, killing some time for, before uh, we had to go meet up with some friends. Um, I think about that and I think about there's so much art in that area mm. uh, and the, and art comes in, you know, obviously different shapes and sizes, but the art that was in that area is there to promote commerce. It's there mm-hmm. to promote brands, but the art's there. There's a lot of art there and it's very warm and it's very, it's designed to make you feel a certain way. Uh, you feel these luxury uh, brands, um, doing their their part to to sell their 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 goods, but at the same time, it 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 makes for the place to come alive. It it feels like there's a lot of life there, and when I think about the restaurant that you have the mural at, I'm envisioning myself walking by, driving by, seeing the mural, and being and having that feeling of being alive, right? And I yeah, think, yeah. You know, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And then I think about where I live and I'm like, uh, I don't feel alive because there's just nothing, you know, there's, there's no movement, I think in this neighborhood to, to kind of like make, and there's a lot of Asian restaurants where I live, but to have, you know, specific pieces like your mural uh, show up. um, And I think in in Orange County, which is about almost an hour away, uh, there are a lot of art, uh, pieces that are um, are are pointing to the memory of the experience that we as the Vietnamese community have lived. Mm. It's, it's tricky. And I appreciate you like, you know, sharing that and like seeing kind of like between like, and that also showcase like what are the community has resources, you know, like yeah. um, one of the things I think about is how art can also fuel gentrification too, you know? And that's the thing is like, oftentimes it's like, the arts and then it makes people a place that people want to move to a fuel like real estate house value and like this idea of you know the buzzword is now creative place making and it's just like you know and like you know so many changes happens throughout like neighborhoods like people move in and out and groups of people you know I'm interested in that but it's like I get wary as like, what are the projects sometimes that I sign on to? Like who's behind it? What is like, you know, the intentionality? Because, you know, like, yeah, people want art and it, but it's like, where is the art coming from and what it's about? Like, you know, like I think about like art that, you know, that is art in museums, art in gallery, art as a form of like investment. People are like, you know, now with NFTs and everything like that. But it's just like, um, what is, you know, the intentionality between certain art and who is it by there's a big thing you know so many discussion now about like you know the art you know who's behind making it and then the collaboration so you know I often think about a lot of that and like you know that's why like art has so much you know different functionality and like you know representation the meaning of it and you know um one of the actually reminded me and this is something I'm slowly kind of working on but would love to kind of put that out there too is that I'm trying to um plan a project for um, 2025, um, the year 2025, which is the 50th 
you know, anniversary of the commemoration of the falls of Saigon. And I'm trying to, um, you know, figure out um, this, you know, there's a big discussion that's happening now, public discourse around, <clears throat> you know, monuments and like, you know, um, you know, yeah, and like monuments that are in the U.S. that's so, you know, old school and mm -hmm. like quite frankly racist that are, you know, being taken down slowly, you know, and there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what's, you know, should be put up instead and all these things. So I've been thinking a lot about kind of um, honoring kind of, you know, spaces and thinking about, um, you know, of course, you know, we talked about that narrative and that like the cyclical of like war and like really having that you know, kind of site and like memorial for like, you know, the Vietnamese diaspora and kind of recognizing and, you know, there's so much like, you know, um, Giao Ka and like events that happens like, you know, annually in the Vietnamese, so many Vietnamese communities throughout the U.S. But like, I, I'm trying to envision, um, you know, sites, even whether it's like physical sites or even like um, using multimedia and even, even hologram to really honor um, the community and really speak to this, the cost of war. And so that can be really like connected from for other communities too. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm slowly kind of, you know, trying to, to figure out that can be replicable models throughout, you know, um, communities throughout the U.S. and possibly kind of beyond too, um, that really honors um, this, you know, 50th, you know, commemoration. I, I have this uh, new thing that not new thing, but this thing that I've talked about in the last couple of a few episodes that I've sat recently. Mm -hmm. Do you call it the Vietnam War or the American War? It's tricky. I mean, it depends where I'm at, when, you know, when I'm in Vietnam. <laughs> but I mean, I, I call it, I mean... Um, in your mind, in your mind, it's like, okay, people go, okay, in your mind, uh, when you think a thought, do you speak English or Vietnamese to yourself? Do you ask the same i'm asking you the same thing do you think of the vietnam war or the u.s war in terms of the vietnam war or the u.s war in your mind when you're thinking i mean to be real honest you know the word that you know comes to like you know that speaks directly to it is the vietnam war right but um it, it like, you know, kind of the perspective and then thinking about there's so much, you know, and it's like, I don't want to like, you know, simplified, like, you know, so much of just like, you know, like the, the, you know, the war as like the starting point of like everything. There's so much that happened before that. And like, you know, after, but it's like, um, but it's true. It's a, it's a real, you know, kind of conversation that even when I was doing that project, the PBS project, when I communicated to community, you know, families, to people who were to participant, it's like, I had to be really careful. And I know we didn't even get into like, you know, conversation around the flag and everything, but it's like, it's, it's a real thing that like, and you have to be really intentional about, you know, I have to be really intentional about who I speak with my audience and in what context too, and what will get, you know, fastest to what, you know, the core is without like muddling and like going, you know, around bushes too. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I talked to a, a U.S. Uh, history professor from out of Texas, a uh, Vietnamese uh, professor um, a few episodes ago, and we talked about this. We're like, we're both, all of us now, uh, me, you, him, children of the South Vietnamese army of um, officers, you know, captains, lieutenant colonels, colonels. We are the descendants of one side, but then how do we, how do we, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, but how do we call ourselves Vietnamese when we call it the Vietnam war? That means that we are outside of Vietnam, but we are on the outside looking at that country as the other, the war was the war of the other, but that's in fact our people. And to call it Vietnam, the Vietnam War means we are not in that because, you know, that means that we are a different country that happened to fight in Vietnam, you know, and I just recently um, thought about this and, you know, and I'm not talking about a communist or an American or a Vietnamese American, I'm just saying placement or just sort of like triangulation. When we say the word Vietnam War, where does that mentally put us in terms of uh, a geography of, 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 of who we identify with, right? Um, yeah. And it's just, uh, is there a way that we can start to reallocate this geography? Um, and I'm just thinking out loud. I hope I don't get crucified for this you know but 
well, fuck it. You know, we're the new generation. We should be able to question these things, right? And, I, you know, I don't want you to take the heat, but I'm, I'm asking this now in a lot of the episodes, um, especially artists, historians, or people who have to kind of make meaning and, and who have to make sense of this stuff. Yeah, no, it's real. And again, and, you know, thinking of and promoting, you know, like topics and, you know, heavy conversation that should be out in the open and not just behind closed yeah. doors, you know. Um, I mean, I think about, um, you know, Vietnamese elders, you know, and, uh, you know, family members who, who refer to it as like, yin you know, it's just that, you know, that's what oftentimes is like, yin that's what they refer to, you know, the war. And it's like, um, I think in the context of think being based in the, in the U.S., when there's been so many wars, it's like, it's almost like that is a way to like specify it. But it's like, it's true in that geo, you know, politics term and like respectability politics. But it's like, when I'm in Vietnam and when you're in Vietnam, it, it's such, it's so different. And it's like, I, I have, you know, friends and, you know, so many different sides. And like, mm-hmm. it's just like in the experience of like, you know, kind of what, you know, the war has, has taught us and that, you know, and yes, we're, you know, children and product of, of war and stuff like that. But it's again, back to that colonialism, like, you know, we were here because they were there. And so it's like this, it's like to acknowledge that, but at the same time to understand, not even just like two sides, there's so many, you know, and then the really the cost of, of it and to really like, you know, preserve, you know, and to really understand the legacy and also that the memories of it, which I know, you know, so many, you know, of our elders are really invested in it. And so, um, and I'm trying to figure out even, you know, um, that translation into, you know, um, you know, different generation. It's like, how do we bridge that? So it's not just, you know, this is a burden on the elders to always like, you know, remember and preserve it, but how do we, you know, translate that into like, you know, um, so that's some of the things I've been, you know, just thinking about, and it's, there's no easy answer, but it's like how, you know, all of our, our journey of realization of this contextualized, but then really acknowledging that, we're here because this happened, it, you know, and it's not, you know, by, you know, and so many factors that kind of play into that. Mm-hmm. In five years, this U.S. men's or women's Vietnam soccer team wins the World Cup. That flag, whatever flag is flying over the soccer team from Vietnam is not our flag, right? We didn't grow up with that flag. But what do we do? What do I tell my daughter? What do I tell my son? Like, I mean, even like using the iPhone and like the emoji, you know, <laughs> like the flag, it's like little like <laughs> negotiation or in our laptop and like the, the you know, the Vietnamese keyboard. And everything. I never thought about that, but oh my God, you're so right. <laughs> it's the most comical thing. Like, but, but the thing is, it's like when you said like it's not our flag, it's like, but it's like, I mean, the you know, even like, you know, um, the South Vietnamese flag, you know. Um, That's not my flag like either. That. None of it is yeah, it's not. Flag. I mean, it's, or not even that. it's like, it's, it's not, it's unsanctioned. It's not, you know, it's that, that kind of partly, you know, that like, you know, the memory, the nostalgia, but it's like, and again, what I know this, you know, when it, it's always, it comes up a lot and like, you're both like, you know, it's like, and that's something it's almost like, it's both, it's an elephant in the room, but it also like stalls conversation and real, I think real bridging of, you know, um, between like generation and like people to like really, you know, in the Vietnamese diaspora and community. And so it's just like, and that was one of the things that, you know, part of the mural is just like, no, we don't even want to like, you know, put that because it's gonna like, you know, not to like, we like for me, I wasn't like afraid of it, but it was just like, it was, you know, a request not to, you know, have anything that's controversial, but, um, but it's, it's, it's a real conversation and it happens again. It's conti- and even like with the January 6th insurrection, it was like, the flags were like all over. The hell is yeah. that? Like that, that means that we're being represented by some clowns. Right. But that's not what that flag should represent. It represents, you know, a whole generation of people who sacrificed their, their lives, I guess, you know, for, for some good, you know, that they, that they envision for their, for their kids and, and a future for themselves. And, but at the same time, I'm talking about my generation, my daughter's generation, my son's generation now, like where, how do they navigate all this stuff? You know, and if we don't talk about it, mm-hmm. if we, people in the media, people who are creating their own sort of trailblazing representation, if this is not 
talked about, it's just going to keep getting more awkward and more awkward. And I don't want to gloss over the fact that there's true pain in loss of life and loss of property and loss of, you know, uh, your way of life. But at the same time, like, wh- how do we, I want the elders and I want people who are on this discussion to, to address this. What are we supposed to do as the young generation? You know, what, what is my children supposed to do and, and not have a, a, a we're not going to have a group of people to root for because this flag issue, I, this nationalistic thing is just, uh, it's eating me inside all the time when I think about it. Yeah, I hear that. The thing that actually really like, I also get like, you know, I'm like, like kind of impressed by is that like the amount of passion that, you know, um, older people, elders in the, you know, the Vietnamese community get riled up and they would, you know, you know, go and protest and like lobby, especially around, you know, like the issue of the flag that will get them like riled up. And it's like, I often like, I'm like, how do I continue to like channel this energy or to like, you know, direct it, you know, like not even redirect it, but you know, it's, it's like, I love it when people have passion, but it's like to a very specific and not like, you know, other issue that may be like affecting and, you know, like, um, but so it's like, I'm always like curious about people's like, you know, pat and what keeps them is as sustained. It's not just even like, you know, certain t- time. It's like literally still ongoing. And it's a like lot of the old folks have nothing better to do. That's the short and simple answer of it. You know, they I mean, that's part of it, but there's, there's something that is just like, so like, you know, that connection and it's like them. that is, you know, the representation of like, you know, that the voice that's out there and it's very like, you know, public in a public way, but it's like, how, you know, and maybe that's part of like, you know, how do we like, and not to like, just be like, Oh, like to shut this down, but how do we, create like really, you know, productive conversations. But one of the biggest problems is this. We grew up in the, I did, I grew up in the lap of luxury compared to what they went through. There's no way I'm going to understand what my uncle went through in 14 years concentration camp. Another uncle died in the country. I'll never be able to, to satisfactorily understand those experiences and their children, which are my cousins, I'll never be under, able to understand when they came in the 90s or the 2000s and they had to suffer through years of horrific um, penalizing, you know, they were penalized for, and here I am, you know, born on the East Coast, I was born in Pennsylvania, uh, had a wonderful childhood. My, my father um, wasn't really the type of person who really talked much about the war because he really didn't he was very detached from, you know, the things that happened for better, for worse. But uh, so I, I recognize the privilege of not having to go through the pain, but at the same time, um, if I'm, if I'm not the one who uh, is going to ask the questions, who are, who's going to ask these questions? Cause these are real questions. That emoji on the phone is the most comical thing, but it's serious at the same time, because it's, you want to have the freedom to, to, to express and the nuance of not being able to do that. It really fucks with you. Or well, for mm-hmm. me, somebody like me, it just that inability to really get down and wave a flag to say, Oh my God, this is like part of my identity too. Mm-hmm. It's inhibiting. No, it's, yeah, I hear that. And I think the other thing is like to understand like the fear and anxiety too. Yes. To, Yeah hopefully shift it and like really talking about it openly, asking the questions in a very accessible, you know, bilingual way or multilingual, but it's like really understanding the fear and anxiety and how that has affected different kind of generations yeah. is also as critical. And it's just like, how do we, you know, like, you know, make the shift in that. And, and why is that? Do we continue, you know, after, you know, 2025 is like the 50th, like, you know, like year commemoration is like how, what, you know, <laughs> how has things shifted? How has things not? Why have things kind of remained the same? You know, you know, that. companies rebrand their logos all the time. That's what we need. We need a rebranding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, the, uh, that's actually what you were talking about earlier about like, you know, like art commercialized. And then now it's like that, you know, the cultural, you know, appropriation. Or now when I, you see like murals, like when like certain brands use like mural as a way to promote themselves, it's like so crazy. I'm like, in a way, it's also really strategic. Genius. Like, and like, yeah, gen- brilliant. But on the other hand, I'm just like, that's so messed up. Like don't <laughs> use like the tool of like, you know, like all these things. So it's like always, you know, like, and that's the co-opting of like, you know, 
capitalize, you yeah. know, commercialize all these things. But like, what? How do we decipher that, and how do we differentiate it so it like it's driven more for like you know progress rather than like a money, you know, kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah way. Well, I'm glad we got to um, you know scratch the surface here because uh, these are important conversations that will pop up in the future of our our lives and our you know our future generations, our kids and and their kids. Um, and I hope that by talking about these things, we were able to normalize uh, relations with human beings across the ocean. That's that's all I want to do. I want to make sure that we as a people are represented under the, the banner of being Vietnamese across the world, wh- whether we live in the U.S. or Germany or, or, or Paris or Vietnam, we all share the common, you know, these common heritage uh, traits. And we just have to be able to um, stand under one sort of people. You know, I want that. That's my dream is to really not be divided, uh, so divided that, you know, obviously there's going to be division in every, everything that humans do. But, you know, in this one um, task is to be able to stand proud and, and, and like Italy, you know, like simple or Mexico, you know, Mexico or Korea. Well, Korea. I don't know. There's a lot of complexity. It's like, you know, I feel like it's <laughs> I, know, I want like to simplify. The, it's almost like the flag question. I'm always curious in like every like culture and community, what is their flag question, you know? And it's like, there's, and to be able to hold, I think complexities and to hold that, you know, and yes, um, pride is, I think, yeah, is, is something that is, you know, critical, but then there's so many other stuff to acknowledge and yes. to really like, you know, hold a lot of, you know, pain and like, but also joy too. And also like, you know, yeah. Healing. Yeah. Work. These are nuances that we, um, yeah. That I'm like, Oh, this is so complex, but, uh, you know, just give me a, just give me something to celebrate, you know? <laughs> and it's like, well, we are, and we, we celebrate our heritage and we're coming together for, you know, despite the differences, you know, bridging, my brother lives in Vietnam. He's been there for 18 years and, you know, I've been operating out of LA for, you know, my entire life and, you know, going back two, three times a year, it's just, uh, you know, it's a mind fuck sometimes when you think about it, you know? Yeah, like how our environments really, you know, really shape us and like yeah. kind of that and like the, the culture. And, you know, I sometimes I think about, you know, the world is like that Pangea and it's like all connected, mm-hmm. but it's like, you know, the, the idea of borders and geography yeah. and like all that. Tribes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cheng, thank you so much for today. It was, you know, again, it was very nice to, to, to get and under, get into your mind and understand uh, the way you think about community and art and how this all, you know, works. And it's messy, but at the same time, um, it's, it's a job that, uh, that, that seems to be so um, uh, needed and valuable for, for everyone, including, you know, the artists uh, themselves, right? Yeah, well, much appreciated. Thank you for holding the space and for continuing to hold, you know, many more spaces moving forward. Um, But yeah, really appreciate the conversation. Okay, thank you so much. I will be talking to you soon. Yes. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at the Vietnamese podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.